as you can see already, we heard about uh, Europa and Venus and Enceladus. Uh, when it comes to searching for life in our solar system, we are spoiled for choice. We got so many great targets. It would be wonderful to see a mission to all of them. I am even now convinced that Venus is a good target. Uh, David Smith and David Grinspoon have turned me around on that. So uh, uh, I'm adding it to my list of uh, places I, I want to go. So it's wonderful. Uh, we're going to hear more about other places today. Uh, Alfonso Davila, the next speaker, may talk about Enceladus and Mars. Uh, and then uh, Morgan Cable will talk about Titan. Uh, so many wonderful destinations. Uh, we should have a guidebook. Uh, maybe we, maybe that the Institute, the Breakthrough Institute, would do that. Yeah, the Hitchhiker's Guide to Searching for Life in the Solar System. You know it when you taste it. Um, okay, so that's the end of the skit. While we're, we're so we're now ready to start. Let me introduce the first speaker in the afternoon session, or the second part of this morning session, is Alfonso Davila. Alfonso is a research scientist at NASA Ames Research Center who focuses on the search for life on other worlds. His background is in biology. He's done an extensive field work in just about all the cool places, cool literally and figuratively, like Antarctica. Alfonso. Thank you. And uh, I was supposed to go and pick a place to search for life. Uh, I think Mars was left in the uh, list. And then, but I didn't. I never listened to what Chris tells me to do. I wonder where I learned that from. And, uh, and so I actually am turning the question upside down. What I'm, the way I organize the talk is, what are we looking for? And then at the end, what's the best place to look for it? Um, and hopefully that brings a kind of a different perspective into the whole problem. Um, so if we can start the presentation. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go, I, 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 I try to um, uh, phrase it in terms of from more, uh, in a holistic term, from more general, oh, oh, it's my fault, I guess. From uh, more general questions, uh, motivations, to how to address those big questions, the means, and do we have a place, what's the best place to do those experiments, an opportunity. Um, early when I started my career, somebody told me, Imre Friedman told me this, the most important question in science is why. That caused a significant amount of self-doubt and psychological damage over my career, constantly <laughs> wondering why are you doing what you're doing. But it also forced me to think very carefully every time I, I say we should do this, why? And when, I, and when we should go there, ask why. And that hopefully reflects in the presentation that I'm going to show you. Uh, it might be wrong at the end, but at least, is, at least I think it's the right way to go about the problem. The solution might be different, but uh, I think it's the right way. So it starts with the why. Why are we actually searching for life? As a scientist, searching for life is not an end in and on itself. Even finding life, it's not an end in and on itself. I'm interested in finding life in other planets because I'm interested in larger questions. Is there a general theory of life? Um, is the uh, origin of life something that can happen many times, or it only happened once? Is life on Earth uh, very, uh, something that is unique, or is it something that is part of a very com a common cosmic phenomenon? And so when you pose these questions that way, not in the way that are we alone in the universe, or are there aliens out there, but when you pose these questions, it really narrows, it really re kind of rephrases the whole thing into searching for a second genesis of life. You might not think there's a difference, but uh, conceptually, uh, there is actually, in fact, there is one. The real breakthrough would be to find a form of life that, whose origin is unrelated to us, a second genesis. Um, the means, that, that right there the, define the mean, defines the means. What do we need to do to search for a second genesis? Um, that's the way I like to think about the problem. To me, finding a second genesis is a phylogenetic problem. Uh, conceptually, a second genesis is defined as something that falls outside of the tree of life. Operationally, uh, a second genesis is an organism that is unrelated to the bacteria, to the archaea, to the eukaryotes, to LUCA, to everything that came before LUCA, and, uh, and the first organism that appeared on Earth. That's, our fun that's the functional definition. As Chris likes to show in, in, uh, uh, oops, in presentations, that aliens 
a second genesis would fall outside of that tree of life. And I think it's very important that we use this structure, the tree, the phylogenetic tree of life, to, to, as we move, uh, as we come up with experiments to search for evidence of life. Somehow it has to have evolutionary sense, taxonomic sense, phylogenetic sense, the experiments we do. Uh, keep in mind that everything we know about life, most of what we know about life comes from looking at these upper branches of the trees, even in, our, in terms of our biochemistry. A lot of that comes down to Luca, the last universal common ancestor that, uh, from which we inherited most, most of our biochemical traits. But there is a, a time before Luca that it's, that it's a bit more obscure, it's much less understood. And uh, certainly, we still don't understand the conditions in the origin of life. So we, might, we need to be mindful of what we know, but also of what we don't know about life on Earth when we come up with ideas on what to search out there. So I, and <clears throat> based on that, I like to think of it in two, I like to think of the possibilities out there before we start thinking about specific biochemical solutions or uh, where places, uh, the best places to go. I like to think of uh, three possible scenarios for life in the solar system. We obviously have the first genesis, life on Earth, that's us. I can think of a planet in the solar system that has life related to us, a common origin, panspermia, either through planetary transfer or through cometary panspermia, other kinds of panspermia. That's an uh, unlikely event, uh, but it's not, it's not a non-zero event, and that needs to be considered. Then I like to think of a close second genesis. I think of a close second genesis as a form of life that is independent from us, but came out of a similar prebiotic soup, similar compounds, similar organic compounds in water and things like this. And then I could think of a distant second genesis as a form of life that came as independent from us and it came from a very different bio prebiotic soup. And I like to use the example of Titan as a place for a distant second genesis, Mars, Europa, and Enceladus, the ocean worlds and the water worlds for a close second genesis. Obviously Mars, it's a um, candidate also for a common origin of life or a transfer of life. Um, and so <clears throat> the easy one is a close second genesis. Common origin would be easy. We know how to find things that are biochemically like us or a thing we, at least we think we do. A close second genesis is what I like to focus on because it's something I understand. It's something that I think I understand or I can, I can guess a few things about what it might look like. And we have a good theory in our hands to start thinking about what a close second genesis might look like. And that's the theory of organic chemical evolution. And you're familiar with this theory. We didn't show up on this planet or the first microbes didn't show up on this planet. They evolved from a prebiotic soup of organic compounds and that became ever more complex until at some point something happened that we call life. And that's still a question mark on how it happened. But we understand a lot of the steps that were involved in that process. Now, at this point, you can guess, well, how can you narrow down all the possible chemical and solutions in the universe? How can you assume that a form of life elsewhere uh, is going to follow the same biochemical steps? Um, <clears throat> it's a possibility, but everything we know about prebiotic chemistry, at least in uh, terms of the composition of meteorites or the chemistry that forms in uh, prebiotic experiments in the lab or in hydrothermal vents and all that stuff is that Prebiotic chemistry or abiotic chemistry follows thermodynamic rules and therefore is predictable. We kind of understand what to expect if we have a system based on water, CO2, methane, ammonia, and we add energy to that system. And so <clears throat> we, there is a possibility that while it is true that the chemical space that is available for, for biochemistry is unlimited, especially when you consider how creative um, evolution uh, can be at inventing new solutions for biochemistry. The chemical space at the origin of life, especially in environments that are geochemically similar, is not unlimited. Or at least it might not be unlimited. There might be a chemical bottleneck when you transition from prebiotic to biological and that, that forces uh, a few choices on those incipient forms of life, as long as they come from similar geochemical environments. Then once life starts, and evolution through the Arvinian processes takes place, then the chemical space becomes unlimited and it depends on the local planet of origin. But we all start with the same set of cards, so to speak. Then we reshuffle them as we move along, but the options in the beginning are probably limited. And so one hypothesis that we might use as we might focus our, we might use in our search is that 
organic chemical evolution in similar worlds might lead to similar incipient forms of life. I'm talking about the very first, the earliest things that we might call living systems. And with time, there, there's going to be divergence, uh, biochemical divergence, as each form of life in its independent planet evolves into different things. And so <clears throat> using those two concepts, the theory of organic chemical evolution, life evolves as uh, ever more complicated chemical organic chemistry, and the principle that all, we all start in, under similar conditions, then I come, I think of an ideal experiment to search for a second genesis, a close second genesis. I would like an experiment that it's, it provides me taxonomic information. It allows me to place, if I get a, a positive, it allow me, allows me to place it, to place it in the tree of life or outside the tree of life. Uh, we use biochemistry for that. It's very hard to place something in the, inside or outside the uh, phylogenetic tree based on morphology or based on uh, movement or things like this. We use biochemistry. It makes evolutionary sense. It has, it, it should be, we, sh we should be searching for something that is primordial and it's also universal. There's no point in searching for something that is only specific to a group of earth organisms. Um, I like whatever we look for to have broad experimental range. And what I mean is that it's great to search for biosignatures that are at smoking guns. But it's even better if you search for something that it's independent of whether life is present or not. The worst result in a life detection experiment is a null result. Or I guess a false negative is worse, but a null result, something that doesn't tell you anything, um, is a bad life detection experiment. We all, we, astrobiologists have to be optimistic by nature, so we always expect to find that what we're looking for. But a negative, uh, a negative result, should, there shouldn't be such thing as a negative result, result in astrobiology if we could get to that point. And it should be based, and that's not often emphasized enough, I think it should be based on verifiable hypotheses. Our experiments should be based not on discovery, not on chance discovery, but on verifiable hypotheses. We might fail the first hypothesis, but what we learn from it, it's gonna inform the next experiment, and we might find that uh, even if might, it might take three steps, three different hypotheses and experiments to, fi to find the, fi the final question, that's always better than uh, trial and error uh, through discovery. So is there, a play, is there anything we can do that actually satisfies these things? I think there is. Uh, this is an example <clears throat> based on amino acids, for example. Amino acids, you know, are the sm small molecules that build up our proteins. Uh, we know that we can use amino acid sequences to tell taxonomy. Uh, Earth, life on Earth uses a set of 20 or 20 plus. Uh, if we look at a broad enough scope of amino acids or set of amino acids, we can tell what based on that, this, the sequence we find whether it's related to us or not, or we can actually narrow down the uh, relatedness. It makes evolutionary sense. Um, might not, uh, proteins and amino acids might not, have, might not have been the first uh, biochemicals in the first forms of life on Earth, but they, were, they came early on. And uh, um, it makes sense for a form of life to use amino acids to build enzymatic molecules. It's not the only solution, but it's a very good solution. It has a broad experimental range. If we go to a place like Enceladus or Mars, there is a very good chance that there will be amino acids. There is, coming back with a, no, with a no result, it's gonna be hard. Actually, it's gonna be very interesting to find a place where there are no amino acids. And we can propose a testable hypothesis on whether those amino acids are biological or not. And because we understand abiotic systems fairly well. If you look at a abiotic system like a meteorite, most of the amino acids in those meteorites are normally glycine, alanine, simple ones, the simplest ones, because nature is, um, pre, pre, na nature makes a lot of simple stuff, not so much a lot, not so much uh, complex stuff. But we are not bound by those laws on, of nature; we're bound by law, the laws of biochemistry. So we make molecules as complex and as uh, unlikely as we need them to be so that they can fulfill their biochemical roles. And so I can confidently say, we might disagree on the numbers, but I personally can co confidently say that if I go to a place and I find three or more amino alpha amino acids whose abundance is larger than glycine, at least I can say there is no abiotic system that we know of where this has happened before, that we've measured that kind of abundances. So I'll call this a very interesting sample to bring back or to do more experiments on. Um, this is another one. Um, and 
Uh, this one is based on alkanes, hydrocarbons, the stuff that we put at the end of fatty acids and phospholipids to uh, build our membranes. The same principle applies. It carries taxonomic information because bacteria use a certain, num a certain type of al alkanes. Uh, some of them are shorter, some of them are longer, but uh, bacteria use it for, to build their membranes in certain environments. Algae use them to build membranes in other environments. And so we can tell taxonomy based on how long the alkanes are in our membranes. They're primordial and universal. I think the first organisms found it very, very, very useful to self-enclose into membranes to be able to carry their biochemistry. Um, again, broad experimental range. I would expect alkanes to be found in most places in the solar system. In fact, Cassini found short uh, hydrocarbons, methane, ethane, butane, all the way to carbon-6, as we saw in the first talk. It would be interesting to see if we could extend those carbon detections up to carbon-13, 20, 25, 30, whether those distributions would be indicative of an abiotic system, which Lovelock already in 1965 uh, explained would that, that would be a useful experiment to do. This is what we would expect from an abiotic system, whereas life, again, builds alkanes based on uh, its specific needs, and the distributions tend to be very similar, very, very different. And so we can have a very a testable hypothesis that if the, concent the concentration of alkanes in our sample is, uh, of short alkanes in our sample is smaller, it's larger than the concentration of large alkanes, that's probably an abiotic system, or at least that's consistent with abiotic chemistry. Um, I'll just throw another, the third example, that probably you're more familiar with in antiomeric excess. We only use one flavor of amino acids. And... Um, to build our proteins. And so based on that, we can also predict that if a certain amount of enantiomeric excess is present in our sample, that means one thing. If, if it's a different amount, it means another thing. In the end, we're measuring something, which is uh, it's going to reveal something about the sample. And at the end, uh, based on that, then the question is, what's the best place to look for this type of, or to carry this type of experiments? Well, this is my personal opinion. That can change. People, uh, we, uh, now we have lots of options, and we can decide uh, which one we like the most. But Enceladus is up there in my uh, preference list. We, we have everything we needed to know bef to, uh, before we can run those experiments, even uh, some of those uh, small molecules that I, I think we should be looking for, like small hydrocarbons. Um, <clears throat> I had to say something about Mars, and so Mars is there. Uh, it's currently uninhabitable. Maybe early Mars was a better place, but preservation of those biochemical compounds is, compounds is limited. Uh, Europa, it's another very interesting place where, uh, where, which might be habitable, but it's difficult. The habitable, the habitable zone is difficult to access. There's poor preservation. As we understand more of these places, this picture might change. That's not a static picture. Mars might have been habitable recently, and then we might still find some of the biochemical compounds. Europa might have plumes that give us access to the ocean. And I'll just end there with kind of the logic that I've been following for this talk. There are many ways you can walk down this tree. I'm, this is just one way. It's great that we have this conversation and we can explore the different ways and the different uh, experiments we can do along the way. So. One very quick question. Oh, very good. Cool, good, and, okay. It can be long then. Uh, I, I enjoyed your talk very much, and I agree with the point that you made and that uh, Carolyn made this morning that evidence of a second genesis would be so tremendously important and would completely change the way we think about life in the universe. But I, I don't want us to uh, leave the impression that finding evidence of a common origin would be sort of a, a lesser discovery. If we, if we um, discover evidence that life uh, can naturally travel between worlds and take root, that biospheres can reproduce, that would completely change the way we think about life, uh, not just in our solar system, but in the universe. So um, e either one would be uh, incredibly si significant. I don't think common origin would be sort of a, a, a disappointment compared to second genesis. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I didn't imply it to be a disappointment. I guess my point, my main point was, uh, it'd be good to come up with experiments that can tell one versus the other when we find it. Uh, because otherwise there's going to be a follow-up mission that we, we will need a follow-up mission. Absolutely, if panspermia turns out to be the, you know, way of life, I'll embrace it. Uh, <laughs> oh. okay, thank, you. No, thank you. Give that to Morgan. Great.